jury is present, seated, everyone else may be seated at the time. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, good morning, welcome back, and happy Friday. Um, first, before we begin today, my uh, normal question, has anybody done any research related to the case, discussed the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else, or been exposed to any reports about the case outside of the courtroom? By show of hands. All right, let the record reflect there are no hands. I have a couple of uh, things I'm going to let you know, but first I'm going to ask the state if there's anything else um, in their rebuttal case. No, Judge, the state uh, rests its rebuttal case. All right, state having rested their rebuttal case, ladies and gentlemen, the next stage of the proceedings, as you may recall from the preliminary instructions I gave you, is the closing arguments of the attorneys, which they are going to do in just a moment. Uh, I have gone ahead and indicated to the bailiffs that they are to order you lunch because you will be deliberating during lunchtime today. So we're going to provide you lunch. Um, don't get too excited. It's probably just sandwiches from the counter over here. <laughs> but uh, we will provide you lunch. I uh, only regret not telling you that yesterday so that if you all bring in lunch, you didn't bring it in. But we will provide you lunch in the jury room during deliberations. So I just wanted to let you know that. I do have one brief instruction that I will read to you before the attorneys begin their closing arguments, and it is as follows. Both the state and the defendant have now rested their case. The attorneys now will present their final arguments. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence or your instruction on the law. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They are intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side will have equal time, but the state is entitled to divide this time between an opening argument and a rebuttal argument after the defense has given its closing argument. Is the state ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Ms. Derry, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. May it please the court, counsel, Ms. Nelson. Good morning. I shot them. I shot Mom and Bob. I didn't think I could do it. I shot Bob. We are here today because of Nicole Nachtman's words and actions between August the 18th and August the 20th of 2015. She had no reason at all to kill Robert Deans but for the fact that he stood in the way of her fully executing the trap that she was setting for her mother. When Nicole Nachtman made the choice to kill Robert Deans and Miriam Deans, she did so in a way that equates to first degree premeditated murder. And ultimately, the state is asking that you follow the oath that you took as jurors and that you apply the law that his honor is going to give you. Apply that to the evidence that you have heard during these two weeks of trial and that you find Ms. Nachman guilty of two counts of first degree premeditated murder. His honor is going to give you all of the instructions that apply in this case. And ultimately, you will receive two jury instructions as to murder in the first degree, one for Robert Deans and one for Miriam Deans. What I want to focus on in this instruction is the definition as to premeditation. Killing with premeditation is killing after consciously deciding to do so. The decision must be present in the mind at the time of the killing. The law does not fix the exact period of time that must pass before the premeditated intent to kill and the actual killing. The period of time must be long enough to allow only reflection by the defendant. The premeditated intent to kill must be formed before the killing. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, the question of premeditation is a question of fact to be determined by you and the evidence that you have been presented. It will be sufficient proof of premeditation if the circumstances of the killing and the conduct of the accused convince you beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of premeditation at the time of the killing. So let's talk about those actions. 
let's talk about how we get here to the ultimate conclusion of premeditated murder. It starts on August the 18th. On August the 18th of 2015, we know that Miriam Deans checked into a hotel in Jacksonville, Florida. You've heard testimony that Miriam Deans was a captain in the Navy and that she regularly traveled as a part of her job. She regularly was gone for various periods of time away from her Carrollwood home. On August the 18th, she checked into a hotel in Jacksonville, leaving her husband, Robert Deans, and her daughter, Nicole Nachtman, at their Carrollwood home in Tampa. We know that at some point on August the 18th, Robert Deans went to Publix, went to China Walk, and went to Pet Boys. We know through a video that's been introduced into evidence that somewhere around 8 o'clock on August the 18th, 8 o'clock in the evening, is one of the last times Robert Deans is seen alive. We know from the testimony of the neighbors that Robert Deans is not seen after sometime that day. <clears throat> so sometime between August the 18th at 8 o'clock in the evening and August the 19th at roughly 9 o'clock in the evening, Nicole Nachtman makes the decision to go into the home and obtain what is believed to be, what I believe the evidence has shown to be, a 380 caliber pistol. Robert Dean's own gun. And then at some time on that day, between that day and the following day, there is no struggle, there is no fight. Nicole Nachtman points a gun and kills Robert Deans, execution style, with one bullet to the back of his head, right through his ball cap. We know Robert Deans collapses, whether he's in a chair or standing up, and the result of the collapsing is he breaks several ribs. We know from the testimony again that there was no struggle involved. Those are the only injuries to Robert Deans. And then it begins. After Nicole Nachtman has executed the first step in her plan to trap her mother and kill her mother, she's got to work on continuing the plan and cleaning it up so that her mother can walk right into it with no knowledge of what's happened to Robert. So what does Nicole Nachtman do? She begins the cleanup process. We know that there's a bottle of bleach in the garage right near the laundry room. We know that there is extensive efforts taken to clean this home. If you recall the testimony of Shelby, Shelby Garman, the crime scene technician, where was the blood? The fennel failing test indicated positive results for the couch, the recliner, the sink faucet, the sponge, various places in the kitchen, the mop bucket. She uses all of these things to clean up as best she can. There's blood on the walls, blood on the refrigerator. And what did FDLE later tell you? That blood on the refrigerator is Robert Dean's blood. That blood on the kitchen floor is Robert Dean's blood. She's cleaning, she's using whatever she is, the sponge, the mop bucket, the bleach, to eliminate any sign of the execution that she's just performed. In the process of this, she has to make the decision to drag Robert Dean's six foot three, 215 pound body into the back bedroom. She's gonna drag it through the house into a bedroom, wrap it in blankets, wrap it in a comforter, close the door and lock it, continue her cleanup. And in the process, she leaves a bloody fingerprint on the wall. Because what did the evidence show you? That fingerprint on the wall was Nicole Nachtman's, and a swab from that same location, according to Ms. Sutton from FDLE, was positive for blood. Perf almost invisible to the naked eye. But Ms. Garman is able to see it and enhance it with Amido Black and discover the bloody thumbprint that she left behind during her cleanup. What else did she do when she cleaned up? She put laundry in. 
the plaid shirt that Robert Deans is wearing in the public's video is found wet in the washing machine. The blue and white Titleist hat that Robert Deans is wearing when he's killed with one gunshot to the back of the head is being washed in the washing machine. She's making active decisions to clean up any trace of the murder that she just committed. Sometime between August 18th and August 19th, again at approximately 9 o'clock, these are the actions of Ms. Nachman. And so it continues. On August the 19th of 2015, Ms. Nachman makes a call to Florida State. Find out what's going on with her housing. Because remember, Nicole Nachman has Florida prepaid. Her dormitory housing has already been paid for. She just has to get it lined up. And no, she hasn't done it yet. She's late. So she makes a call to find out what's going on with her housing. They tell her we don't have a space yet. And then soon after, very soon after, at approximately 11.30 on August the 19th, the evidence has shown that she receives an email from Jessica Gilbert at Florida State. You got your housing. We have a spot for you. At 11.30 on August the 19th, some almost 20 hours before she kills her mother, she gets her housing. So she gets her housing, and what does she do? Mom's still not there, mom's still in Jacksonville, so Nicole Nachman on her own, stepdad is dead. She now takes the contract that they sent her, she fills it out, puts her phone number, her Gmail email address on there, puts her mom as the contact person. She fills it out, she's getting ready to send it back in, she knows she also has to obtain a deposit. She can't ask Robert because he's dead. And she can't ask her mother because she's planning to kill her. So she goes to her cousin David Lear's house. She goes to David's house, and at this point, in Nicole Nachman's mind, she's so aware of what she plans to do, she's telling David, can I borrow the money? No problem. Thank you. Gets the money. Hugs him goodbye. He thinks it's a little strange, you know? She, she really wants to hug goodbye. It's, not necessarily what they always do. She makes it a point to say goodbye to him. And then what else does she tell him? He says, when am I gonna see you again? When are we gonna see you again? Oh, probably around Thanksgiving, the next, the next natural break or holiday for a college student. That's what she tells him. Lies. So she gets the money from him, she then goes, she takes that money, she deposits it into a bank, sends it to Florida State, and approximately five o'clock, on August the 19th, after 5 p.m., because Ms. Gilbert testified she didn't receive it till the next day, after 5 p.m. on August the 19th, she sends back her contract to confirm her housing at Florida State. Now the contract's in, her housing's set up. There is nothing at all preventing Nicole Nachman, now that she submitted her contract, from getting in her car and driving to Florida State only thing preventing her is that she hasn't followed through on her plan to kill her mother. So she waits. She stays at the house. At some point between August the 19th and August the 20th of 2015, Nicole Nachman makes a phone call to her mother. We heard testimony that they talk and she tells him something about having talked to her roommates that she's going to be meeting. And then what else do we know happens on August the 20th? Well, at some point on August the 20th, Nicole Nachman has the forethought in her mind to think, I've killed Robert about a day ago now. Mom's probably wondering where he is. I'm going to check his email. She has the forethought to think, I need to go into Robert Dean's email account, Yahoo email account, so that I can check and see if mom's trying to reach him because he's not answering the phone because he's dead in the bedroom. So she goes on to his email account. And her internet history, her search history, it's all in evidence. How to change a password on Yahoo. Nicole Nachman has a Gmail account. The evidence has shown. How to change that password on Yahoo. And then what do we see? We see an email forwarded to her 
that was an email from Miriam Deans to Robert Deans trying to reach you. Your phone's going to voicemail. So these are thoughts in her mind. I need to do this to check this email to make sure that I try and get my mom here without suspecting anything wrong. She replies to the email, forwards the email to her account, and we know that at some point on that same day in the afternoon, Elizabeth Ray sees Nicole Nachtman at that home doing something by her window. We know that Nicole Nachtman remains at that home in Carrollwood until approximately 5.53 when her Garmin GPS unit inside of her car shows that the car is now at a park approximately one and a half miles north of her home, and the Garmin GPS unit is now turned off at 5.53 p.m. So again, this entire time, now at almost six o'clock on August the 20th, Nicole Nachtman, following through on her plan, coming from that park back to her home in Carrollwood, about one and a half miles away, always keeping the gun, the whole time, never knowing when her mom's actually going to walk in, but waiting for her. Even though she's told her family she's going back to school, has got her housing at Florida State, and mom's hours away in Jacksonville, waits for her to come back, because she's got to follow through with her plan. So what happens next? Well, we know Nicole at some point is sitting in the family room watching a movie, a movie that's paused when law enforcement arrives eating a bag of Cheetos that's sitting there on the couch, open. Lights are all on in the house. No signs of a struggle obvious to law enforcement. No signs of blood immediately obvious to law enforcement. Done a great job of cleaning it up so that when mom walks in the door, puts her purse and her keys down, no reason to suspect anything's wrong. And at that point, Nicole Nachman still with the gun in her hand, the same gun that she used 24 hours ago to kill her stepfather with the same gun in her hand, puts three bullets in her mother. She doesn't miss because there's three shell casings found at the scene and there's three projectiles recovered from Miriam Deans. Torso, abdomen, neck. Puts three bullets in her mom with no issue. And then she gets in her car, excuse me, she leaves to go to her car because remember her car's not there because had it been there, her mother would have known that she was still home. So her car couldn't be there in order for her plan to work. So she now walks or runs the distance to her car somewhere between 9.30 and 10 o'clock at night. And the next thing that we know is that at 10, 19 p.m. on Thursday, August 20th, her Garmin GPS starts back up and she drives to Tallahassee. Mom's dead, Robert's dead, her plan's been followed through on, now she can go live her life. So she drives to Tallahassee. The phone records and the GPS coordinates document that at some point she stops at rest areas, for some period of time, perhaps to sleep, continues her drive. And at approximately 8.15, 8.20 the next morning, Nicole Nachman gets a call from Detective Messer. Starting to call the family, starting to put the pieces together, figure out what's going on. We've talked, we've talked a lot during this trial We've talked a lot during this trial about the words of Nicole Nachman, about the things Nicole Nachman has said to experts in interviews after this offense, years after this offense in some cases. We've heard a lot about the different things Nicole Nachman said. What does Nicole Nachman say to Detective Messer less than 12 hours after she kills her mother. We know this phone call is at approximately 8.20, 8.30 in the morning, less than 12 hours after she puts three bullets in her mother. What does Nicole Nachman say to Detective Messer? What is her voice? 
What does she sound like? What is her thought process? Let's listen. she's going to be staying in or she thinks she's going to be staying in tells him things asks him question is she in the hospital what hospital having a conversation with him responding to his questions asking him questions back continuing her plan so after that Nicole Nachman is now well aware that the police are involved and that the police are working and doing their investigation so what is the next thing she does the next phone call is to Eric Lear Soon after, let's listen to what she says in this call, still less than 12 hours after the death of her mother. Hey. Hey. Nikki. That's right, yeah. Did you call the detective? Yeah, I left the voicemail. What's the address? Oh, the address? Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the address? It's uh, 78. Uh, Way. Wait, 78 Chieftain Way? Yeah. Is that, is that like Chief and T.A.N.? Yeah. Chieftain Way? Tallahassee. Tallahassee? Okay. Well, so you haven't talked to him yet? 
Okay, Nikki, what's the number that I gave you? What's the number? Four seven. Four seven. Four seven. Four seven. throughout this trial, Nicole Nachman's thought processes, her the way of talking, and the things that she said to people after this offense. I submit to you that the best evidence of Nicole Nachman's thought process are those statements on those calls less than 12 hours after she murdered her mother. She has absolutely no trouble answering the questions. His name is Detective Messer. This is the phone number I called. I left a voicemail, she gets the number back from him, she gives the address of where she is, what dorm she's staying in, she follows along in a logical manner, having that conversation with both Eric Lear and Detective Messer. That is the best evidence of what's going on in Nicole Nachman's mind, closest in time to when she committed these crimes. And what does she say? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I mean, I mean, no, no, I'm not. Nicole Nachman's fine. She's fine with what she's done, but she knows that she shouldn't be. She has the thought to know, I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't act like I'm fine. What else does she say? Less than 12 hours after she killed her mother. Well, you know, she had a lot of people who didn't like her. She's already thought, the police are investigating me. They're on the phone with me. I got to try and put this on someone else. Those are conscious thoughts of a murderer. She knows what she did, and she's got to try and play it off. You know, there are people that didn't like Mom. And, you know, Mom and Robert, you know, they had issues, too. These are things that she's already thought about in her mind. These are not disorganized, illogical thoughts. These are not hallucinations. After these phone calls that we've just heard, what else do we know happens that morning? At some point around 9 o'clock in the morning, she checks in with Christina Chiodi at Florida State. Ms. Chiodi reports that she seems fine. There's no obvious concern to her that nothing seemed out of the ordinary. We also know from her roommates that she encountered later that morning at Florida State that she gave them various stories. Mom's in an accident. My mom just died. The police are coming to talk to me. We know that at some point on that morning, she also calls her best friend, Laura Hesmer, and says to her, thank you. Thank you for having been a good friend to me. She knows exactly what she's done and what's happening. And lastly, who do we know that she talks to on August the 21st? Joey Carey, her most trusted confidant, her best friend. What does she tell Joey? I shot them. I shot mom and Bob. I didn't think I could, but I shot Bob. And when she first gets on the phone with Joey, before she even admits to what she's done, I'm gonna miss you. I'm gonna miss you, Joey. Because she knows what she's done and she knows she's going away for it. I'm going to miss you. Nicole, why are you going to miss me? Are, are, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Oh, gosh, no. No, no, that's not what I'm thinking about. 
That's what she says to Joey Carey. There are no suicidal thoughts in her mind when she talks to Joey. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? No, I wouldn't do that. I shot them. And what does Joey say? She's proud of herself. She actually sounds like she's proud of it. And he continues to talk to her. What else does she say? You can call me a beast, but don't call me a monster. And what's one of the last things she says? If only I would have gotten the news earlier, I wouldn't have had to do it. If only she would have gotten the news about her housing earlier, she wouldn't have had to set the trap that she set for her mother to walk right into so that she could kill her and eliminate her from her life and eliminate the way that she hampered Nicole from living the life the way she wanted to live it. Eliminate her from the picture. And she killed Robert first for no reason but that he stood in her way of executing her plan. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not unsympathetic to mental illness. And it is not disputed that Nicole Nachman has a mental illness. But her mental illness did not justify the execution-style murders of Robert and Miriam Deans between August the 18th and August the 20th of 2015. And based on that, we are asking that you find her guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. Thank you. Ms. Mercy, so what, Bulgaria?